And you've all seen these wave matrices where something like this goes from 0 to 2. This has uh, bits, right? And then maybe it's position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then there's these letters. You know, I'm not using color here, but you've got these letters of different height. Usually, actually, the, the tallest letter is on top, right? And then the, the smaller ones. OK. Um, so what does this represent, actually? Let's talk about what kind of molecule we're talking about. Yeah, what is this a representation of? Is this a, is it protein or is it DNA? DNA. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, this is, you know, we'll, we'll follow these two threads actually uh, today and uh, maybe into tomorrow because uh, it really depends on how you think about what this means, whether it's protein or DNA, right? Is essentially the information theoretical way of thinking about this, where you think of it as a property, you know, summarizing the properties of a collection of DNA sequences, like instances of binding sites of a particular prescriptive factor, for instance, right? Uh, and this somehow would be the related to the frequency of in which you see an A at the first position in some kind of multiple alignment of multiple of those binding sites, right? Um, but there's also, so that's when you think about it as DNA, right? You have a set of DNA sequences, you want to summarize their properties, Right, one way to summarize is just write a list of the DNA sequences, right? So we could do that. We could say we have uh, A, C, G, C, G, T, and then maybe you have another example of this binding site, but, but then next you may see something like this, right? There's a point mutation over here. You could have a T there, right? So uh, somehow there's a tolerance for a mutation there, and then maybe the next motif has a... Uh, as an A at the end, and then um, keep going. Maybe once in a while, there's a T here instead of a C, etc. Right? Um, now, in the old days, which you know, not too long ago, right before all the genomics, uh, this is what people had. If you think about TransFact, right, the transcription factor database, which has a lot of these kind of logos and, and tools for searching for motifs, until pretty recently, the underlying data for those weight matrices was something like five binding sites, maybe 10. In a good case, it would be 20 binding sites, right? So, um, and the idea is to, to generalize from having some sample of these binding sites to some kind of general <coughs> recipe for saying, okay, this is a binding site and this is not a binding site, right? So you know, we wanna use these to build some kind of classifier, a sequence-based classifier. We can plug in a sequence that came from somewhere in the genome and we want to answer the question, is this also a binding site, right? Could this also be a binding site for the same transcription factor? Um, right, so it's a representation of DNA sequences, and it, it approaches the problem of finding uh, binding sites and then binding specificity, capturing that as a classification problem. This is a binding site, and this is not a binding site. Right? Now, I heard at least one or two people also say protein, right? So, so what do we mean by that? If you say it's a property of, of protein, can you elaborate on that? Well, yeah, I don't know whether it was you, but <laughs> you know, if you say this doesn't represent DNA, but it represents protein, right? Really what it, what it represents, I guess, is the, the interaction between the DNA and the protein, right? And so if you take a more biophysical point of view of this problem of protein, DNA interaction, um, there's basically, um, and so maybe we'll do the, the biophysical representation, build it up from, from the right side here, right? We have um, DNA, which I'll, I'll draw as a line, right? And then we have a protein, which I'll, I'll draw as a circle. And then we can form a protein DNA complex, right? So there's gonna be, say, an alpha helix of the transcription effect is gonna go into the major groove of the DNA and form hydrogen, and bonding contacts with the DNA, right? And it does that um, because it's energetically favorable if the sequence is favorable, right? The DNA sequence is favorable. There's, you know, there's good matches between the, the kind of chemical properties of the amino acids in the interface of the protein and the, uh, and the DNA, right? But other DNA sequences may not have such good, you know, only some of these optimal contacts can be established, right? And then some others, you'd be satisfying yourself with binding to the the backbone phosphates of the DNA, right? Now, um, so there's an increase in, or like a, it's energetically favorable because of the enthalpy or, you know, all kinds of interactions at the interface, 
Uh, also, you pay a price for binding because you're taking this protein out of solution, right? And that it can move around much more freely, and so you, you pay entropy. It costs entropy to get this protein out of solution and bind it. Right? And the difference between this cost of entropic cost of getting the protein out of solution, which is called the chemical potential, and, and then this binding energy, that really determines, uh, you know, the, the balance of this equilibrium. There is there's an on rate, K on, uh, and, you know, some rate per second that this happens for one molecule, right? And then there is an, an off rate as well, right? And it's, it, it will turn out that it's the, 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 the ratio of these two rates, uh, which is called the KD, the dissociation constant, K <coughs> off over K on. And that basically summarizes <coughs> the, uh, the property of the DNA model, right? So for every DNA sequence, we have a different KD. So if you have this biophysical point of view, you would say, I have not a list of, of just some examples of, of actual binding sites, but I could make a systematic list of all the possible. So we were talking about hexamers there, so let's do this for hexamers, right? We start with A, 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 and then A, A, C, et cetera, up to T, 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 T. How many sequences is that? Four to the six, right? Four thousand ninety-six. Um, and then this would be one column in, in some kind of table, right? And then there would be a KD of sequence S, right? If we call this sequence S, and this is the KD of sequence S. And then, you know, these KDs, what is actually a typical KD for, what is the dimensionality of a KD? Well, for Picamo, that's a, yeah, that's the dimensionality of what? It's uh, you know, it's concentration, actually, it turns out, right? KDs are living, are in the same, of the same dimensionality as just, say, free protein concentration. Um, uh, typical, for a transcription factor, typical KD is 10 nanomolar, which means that at a free protein concentration of 10 nanomolar, uh, you know, you would be binding at about a 50% uh, level, right? That's the definition of the KD. We'll, we'll derive this, you know, where we, but we'll finish the, the other way of looking at this first, but I just want to, you know, start you thinking about this alternative biophysical way of thinking, right? So then, if you have this biophysical point of view, you'd just like to have a lookup table of the KD or, you know, the inverse of the KD, which is the KA, right, which is the affinity, um, as a function of the sequence, right? Um, and so the ideal representation of the DNA binding specificity of a transcription factor at least like in ter thermodynamic sense, right? So you have some kind of equilibrium between the bound and the unbound states where only the ratio of these two rates uh, matters, right? There's no time dimension, right? At least in a thermodynamic uh, kind of description, you want to have this lookup table, right? So now it becomes a practical problem of how do we put a number on each of those sequences, right? And then it turns out that still you have to make some assumptions and maybe you want to add up some kind of free energy score or multiply some kind of affinity contribution across the different positions uh, in this binding sequence. And you still end up with something like a weight matrix and a sequence logos like that, right? But the way you think about the, this is very different from, from that. But that is, you know, that framework was the best framework in the one on the left where you have a set of example binding sites, you try to build a classifier with the data that was available until uh, definitely 10 years ago. Right, and 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 it's only now in the last couple of years that we're getting this high throughput data of in vitro protein DNA interaction uh, for a substantial fraction of the of the human uh, uh, transcription factor. Question. Mr. Chair, uh, when you see a uh, key on one key on this calculator, is there any factor in the future of protein computation where uh, the unbound or DNA or sequencing is not considered uh, hypothetical? Well, yeah, okay, so let's 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 work this out, right? So, um, right, the way it works is. You can say, okay, let's let's write down an equation for the the rate uh, at which we create, you know, the, the change in this complex, right? So uh, so there's there's a gain term, right? The on rate, right? But then times the concentration of the protein and the concentration of the DNA. Whenever I write 
This, it, I mean the free protein concentration, the free DNA concentration. That's actually important, right? It's a, we, we may know the total amount of DNA, but then some of it is going to bind to protein. It's actually harder to, to predict that what is the free concentration, but all the equations I'll be writing are in terms of the, protein, the free form of the protein, right? So this is the rate, you know, of in which we gain these complexes, right? And then um, there's another uh, term that is the loss of this complex. Well, that's K off. And then times the concentration of the protein DNA complex, right? And when these two are in balance, right? So if this thing equals this, then you have a stationary state, right? So this is how the on and the off rates relate to to these concentrations, right? And there's you can rewrite this in in different ways, and a particularly useful way to rewrite this equation is to um, to say what is the ratio of the protein DNA complex divided by the concentration of the DNA. In other words, what, what fraction of you, uh, well this, what, what's the, you know, the ratio between the bound DNA and the unbound DNA, right? If, if it's 50% binding, this ratio will be one, right? So I'm just dividing, right? You can, in your head, you can kind of do this, and what you find is that this is K off right, divided by K on, right? I'm dividing by K off um, over here. Oh wait, it's actually the wrong way around. Sorry about that. Right? So it's K on divided by K off times the free protein concentration. Right? And then with this definition of the KD, right, this is protein concentration divided by KD. Right, you see, these are both concentrations. So it's the concentration of the protein DNA complex and the concentration of the free DNA. And this is a concentration, so it follows that the KD also has a dimension of it. And it makes sense intuitively, right? If, if there's more pr free protein, right, that would push the equilibrium more towards the, the bound DNA relative to the unbound. Yeah, so we'll be talking about that a lot. So we will be talking about uh, high throughput data for, for instance, uh, in, in these days, in vivo data such as protein binding microarray data. There's, you can grow double-stranded DNA molecules on a microarray and then incubate it with purified protein that's labeled fluorescently somehow. Martha Bullock at, at uh, Harvard Medical School is one of the pioneers, and also with Tim Hughes in Toronto, they've applied this uh, uh, to to, to many a different transcription factor family. So that's one way of, of, of doing this. And then you get fluorescent intensities across all the probes on that array, right? And you know what the sequences are on the array. Uh, you may not know the free protein concentration, but you can fit it as a model parameter. And then you can also try to get those KDs out for all the different sequences. But it's complicated because the probes on that array are not just one binding site. They're somewhat longer molecules, maybe 30 base pairs long, and you don't know, you don't have control over where the protein binds within that probe. So you have a deconvolution problem as well. So, so I'm, I'm just building it up slowly, but I will be talking about those kind of algorithms too. Okay, so, so this is the biophysical way of looking at it, and that's the, that's the classification information theory uh, way of looking at it. So I'll come back to this, but uh, we'll now pick up from where we left over there and, uh, and talk about weight matrices and PSSMs and log odd scores and, you know, what, and what the height of the letters uh, represents. So if you have a set of sequences like this, right, and you want to summarize it, um, you, you have to make some um, approximations. For instance, you know, a question we could have is, can a T also uh, co-occur with an A, right, at the, at the sixth position, T at the second position, right? We don't know. We don't have an example like that, right? But, but if we look at these sequences, we could say, okay, now once in a while you find a T instead of a C here at position number two, and then once in a while, right, you find a, a, um, uh, an A instead of a T at position six, right? So it's not 
unthinkable that you would see the combination as well, even though that doesn't occur in your set of training sequences, right? So um, a, a way to approach that is to, to assume that what's going on at the different positions in the binding sites um, are, is, diff is independent of each other. So, um, and you know, there's a, there's a kind of a chemical uh, rationale for that. If you think about the interface between the protein and the DNA, then right, if you make a, a point mutation, you change the base pair somewhere on one end of the binding site, right? Um, that base pair is being recognized by amino acid side chains, you know, that part of the protein it's not necessary. You could, you know, it's plausible that that wouldn't influence how other amino acids recognize another base pair somewhere else in the binding site, right? Of course, there could be subtle things, and it turns out there are dependencies. But at least this is the uh, assumption that you can basically study each column in this alignment uh, on its own. Right. So now, how do we summarize? Uh, one column in the alignment. And also, you know, I just want to emphasize, this assumes that you have a way of aligning these sequences, right? In this case, that's not hard because there's enough of a fixed part that right there is, you can anchor this and it's pretty obvious how this alignment works. If you have transcription factors that allow more variation in the kind of sequences they bind to, the alignment itself is not necessarily a trivial uh, problem, right? But we'll ignore that. Um, um, we'll just go ahead with, with, with this alignment. Right, so, so what you could do is you could count, um, right, and we could write up a little table now uh, where there's four rows in the table, A, C, G, and T, uh, and the, there's columns in the table that corresponds to the base pair positions um, in the alignment. <coughs> and of course, when I'm writing this sequence, right, I really mean it's a, it refers to a double-stranded DNA molecule, right? So, so for instance, the first one is really five prime, and then A, C, G, C, G, T, and then there's a three prime end, and then there's a complementary strand, right? A, in this case, actually, it happens to be the same sequence reading from five prime to three prime, right? And then there's hydrogen bonds between these guys. So, what is this? Uh, what is special about this binding site? Or is it is this a general property that the sequence from five prime to three prime on the reverse strand is the same as for the other strand? That's a palindrome, right? It's uh, with the you know reverse. It's reverse complement symmetric, right? You you read it backwards, but then also you change T to A and G to C because you're really talking about the complementary strand in a in a B form DNA uh, duplex. Right, but these these sequences are are special because they have this kind of reverse complement symmetry. Um, if you think about the structure of the transcription factor that is binding to such a sequence, what what do you think is the origin molecularly of of this palindromicity of, the, of these sequences? If you see a palindrome kind of binding site, what does it suggest to you about the uh, like the non-structural biologists among us? <laughs> no, you can answer. It's fine. Uh, right, and what what kind of dimer? A homodimer, right? It's the same uh, protein forming a, a dimer with itself. And then, right, you could, and uh, I'll try to, when I have, uh, next time I talk, I have a, a computer here, I'll bring up from the protein database a protein DNA complex, so you can actually see this, right? It's, it's actually very instructive uh, to, to look at this and rotate the structure, because for instance, um, forward strand and reverse strand is a very different thing from binding in the forward direction and in the back in the reverse direction, proteins don't bind to a strand, right? They bind to a, a groove that's created by both strands, either the major groove or the minor groove, right? So it, it's a subtle but important difference. So like these differences, these symmetries of the of the protein, right? But in this case, you could imagine there's some kind of you know protein that binds to this in some kind of homodimeric. Uh, way, right? And then if you would rotate the structure so that you, that this five prime end would now be put here and this three prime end would be put there, right? So you'd be basically swapping the two single strand DNA molecules, right? Then the, the proteins come along with the DNA molecules and then you would also map this protein molecule onto that protein molecule. But because they have the same amino acid sequence and they're the same protein, it's basically the same complex and therefore the 
right? The, 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 the binding preference for if you read off uh, on the forward strand is the same as that for the reverse strand. And then you have this palindrome situation. Okay, so just to make you think a little bit about this, these, uh, the structure, right? And the actual molecules that we're trying to model. There's a lot of people who spend, and including me, until uh, we started to really look at crystal structures who, who don't really think in these terms when they're thinking, worrying about the motifs. But I think it's important to actually keep this kind of structural side of things uh, in mind while you're doing the motif analysis. Okay, so, so how do we summarize this alignment now? So we'll just count how many A's we have. There's four A's at position right and one, and then there's, there's zero C's and zero G's and, and one T. Um, now, does this mean that if I have a C, let's say now I have a binding site somewhere where there's a C at the first position, and then all the other positions have the, like the most popular base there, right? Does it mean that it's, that you would never expect the transcription factor to bind to a site with a C at that first position? Probably too harsh, right? Because we, we only have five examples of this binding site. If we would have had a, a hundred, maybe two or three of those would have been a C, right? And it would still have been tolerated. So when, when people construct these kind of count matrices, uh, it's very uh, common to add a so-called pseudo count to, to this. You could say, the a priori, I'm going to assume that all bases are equally tolerated at this position, right? So, and, and one way to express that is to uh, start counting from one instead of zero, right? So let's assume that everybody gets a free vote, A, C, G, and T. But now, and now I'm starting to add the actual counts to it, so A will now become one plus four is five, Right, and T will become two. And you can imagine if we had like 10 times as many sequences, right, this would be um, 51 or, or 41, and this would be, uh, uh, what is that? Hmm. Uh, I guess 11, right? And the, these ratios, right, the, the ones that you start with are not as important anymore, right? So it also has this fact that as you have more data, you kind of update your prior expectation that the this prior becomes uh, less influential, right? But it's, so it's, it does a nice uh, thing of, of not completely disallowing things that are not in your training set. Right? Okay, so these are counts, N, so we have uh, some matrix of um, bases by positions, and now we, we go to frequencies. So if I have N, J, B, where J is the position within the binding site and B is the base, right? Um, I could construct a frequency, f, j, b, just by taking this n and then dividing by the sum over all uh, possible bases. Right, all dummy variable b prime, n, j, b prime. Right? So I just sum these up, there's my total count, and I just divide each count by that. I get a frequency matrix. Okay, and now, once I have these frequencies, I have a model for generating sequences that look like my training set, right? So now I could, I could uh, start to play a, a game where I have a, a dice, a pyramidal dice with A, C, G, and T on the side. So maybe, but it's not completely symmetric. My, maybe, right, I'll, I'll get A more often if I roll this dice than, uh, than a T, or, and, and I hardly ever get a, a G or a C, right? Um, and I could roll this dice, and then whatever I get, right, that is the, the base that I go with. And then I, I have a second dice that's different, has different biases for position number two. I also roll it once, right? I get a different base, and I do this, I have these six different dice, each corresponding to one of the column in this weight matrix, right? I roll each of them once, and then I record what I get every time, and that gives me a sequence of length six that is like these, but it doesn't have to be part of the training set, right? And for instance, it could include a sequence that has a T here, and uh, or that has a... Uh, we yeah, write a T here and an A over there, for instance. Yeah. So we could say the, the probability of, um, and so let's call this the foreground model. The probability of a given sequence, given the foreground model, right? The, you know, the fact that we have, we actually, you know, have a, a frequency model that summarizes these actual binding sites, right? Is something like the, the, the product over all positions 
in the binding site from one to, let me call it capital J, where, which is six in our case, right? And then we take the, the frequency of, you know, at position J of whatever um, base I have at position J. Let's call SJ is, say, the base at position J. Right? So it's just taking product of these frequencies, one from each column, after I normalize this matrix by the counts, right? That will give me a probability of, of generating a particular sequence. Now, since these are the actual binding sequences, right, I also need to define some kind of statistical model for what random DNA looks like, right, the, the non-binding sequence. So there's different ways of doing this, and some of you may have heard about Margaret. You have a question? It's a product because of independence, because it's really the probability of simultaneously seeing whatever you have as the first base and whatever you have as the second base, right? And then the probability of the combination of those two, if those two positions are independent, is the product of the probabilities. There's the point. Thank you. Right? So, so the independence assumption that we talked about a little bit earlier, right? Assuming independence between the positions, here becomes a product of frequencies, right? Um, well, uh, if you talk about binding free energies, which you'll get to later, um, it, it's equivalent to adding up the binding free energies, right? So then it's additivity. So independence could either be multiplicativity, that you assume you can multiply things for different positions in a binding site, or you can add them up, depending on what you're talking about. But the free energy is really the log of a probability, right? It's just a complicated way of writing a, a relative probability. Uh, with some weird units like kcals per mole, right? So you're still really multiplying probabilities of, of different configurations. <coughs> okay, so we have a recipe uh, for, for generating se random sequences, but biased random DNA sequences that have the same kind of statistical properties as, as this training set, right? By, and that's, this is how you would do it. <coughs> and now, what is the probability of... Uh, a sequence given the background model. Okay. That's also a pro product over positions within the binding site. But these frequencies are different. We have to, and again, there's, there's different ways, fancier and less fancy ways of doing this. The simplest way is to say, okay, my background model is uh, just a single column weight matrix, A, C, G, C, G, T, and then I have probabilities P, A, P, C, P, G, and P, T, which could be 25% each, for instance, right? But also, for instance, you know, some genomes, like the yeast genome and other genomes, they, they are not so equally distributed across A, C, G, and T, right? So that means if you pick any random hexamer window in the genome, right, and you look there, you're more likely to have A's and T's there than G's and C's, right? So then your randomly picked hexamers, right, your, your background model would need to have those biases. Uh, but let's assume we have the simple model for the background. It just says there's some probability of getting an A if I pick a random window, some probability of getting a C at a given nucleotide position, um, et cetera. Right? And then uh, if I call these, so this is now P sub B, right, the probability the, you know, in the, the background probability of getting a base B, it would just be the sum over, you know, whatever is S of at position J is whatever, you know, base I have at position J in this particular sequence. <coughs> right, so just make this, um, come up with an example, right? So, so the probability, you know, it's the same as this P, maybe, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just keep P. Right, so the probability of say A C G C G T given the foreground model, right? I'm just going to write out this equation, but with a specific example, right? Uh, this is the frequency at position one of having an A, right? And then, which means is the first element of this frequency matrix, right? And then I go on to the next column and I, I have a C at position two, so I'm picking the probability that's in the second row in the second column, right? So it's frequency at position two of C and then position three, G, F four, 
C, F5, G, and then F6, T. Right? Column one, row A. I know that matrices usually the first index is the row and the second one is the column, right? But don't, don't be confused by that. Um, and then the probability of seeing the same sequence given the assumption that is that it is a random sequence, right? That's not a binding site, would be the probability of A. There's no position one here, right? Because this background frequency is independent of position within the binding site. We don't even have a binding site. We, we're not interpreting this sequence as a binding site. Right? We're just uh, and then so then we have a probability of second position being a C and then third position being a G and then we have another C and another G and then another T. Right? So I could write this as you know P C squared times the probability of G squared times the probability of T. But it doesn't really matter. So I plug in the same sequence here, right? But I'm computing the probability of observing this sequence given different interpretations of the sequence, right? So this gets at this classification problem. I want to infer, I look at the sequence, I put a window somewhere in the genome. Maybe I'm sliding a window across a promoter region and I'm looking for, you know, binding sites starting from some kind of weight matrix model, right? Um, I need to 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 make a call is this a binding site does it look like a like a binding site or do, is it not a binding site right so so what i now the problem is that both of these probabilities are pretty small right typically um, but really what matters is is the ratio of these two right so there's a likelihood ratio now for a given sequence that is the probability of that sequence given the foreground model divided by the probability of that same sequence given a background model. Right. Now, what I would like to know is, can somebody put this in words? Like, what if we do this classification problem, right? I ask, what is the probability that whatever sequence I have in my sliding window is a binding side of my constriction factor, who's, you know, Binding preferences I'm modeling with this weight matrix like model. So, so what I'd like to know, I, I know the sequence, I have the sequence, right? I'd like to know whether I the foreground case or the background case. Just so I can remember, what's the case of likelihood? Or well, L is the likelihood, you know, it's the likelihood ratio actually. Okay. Right? So this is just my definition of it, right? So I'm just writing a it's a shorthand notation in this case. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So um <coughs> So what we'd like to know is what is the probability that that we have a binding site, that we have a foreground model case, right? That the model is the foreground model given the sequence. Right? We'd like to go from the sequence and then ask, is it foreground or background, right? They each have a probability. So for instance, this probability plus this probability given the same sequence, right? has to add up to one, or it's really, you know, it is the probability of seeing the, the, uh, the no, actually this, this, this adds up to one. So, right, so it's either this foreground or background, right? And we'd like to know what it is. So we'd like to know what is the probability that this is really a MFT model. Now, um, if you, uh, so I'm not gonna, derive this, I posted some lecture notes where it turns out you need something called Bayes' theorem, right? Bayes' theorem is a general theorem that says, you know, if you have something like the probability of the data given the model, right, and you want to know the probability of the model given the data, um, then uh, you, you, you can actually invert this, right? There's a, there's a straightforward equation for that. The only thing is that this equation forces you to specify something and that is the following it is um, the probability of the foreground given the pro divided by the probability of the background that's called an l0 like the prior you know 
likelihood ratio. So, and this Bayes' theorem is, is very old, you know, it's like hundreds of years old. This inspired a lot of controversy because many people don't like that you, this subjective aspect of it that you have to specify this prior belief before you can really put a number on this thing, right? So what I'm saying is that if you have this, if you have the ratio of these two guys, which we do because we have these formulas, right? You can, you can implement this in a computer, you can come up with some number, right? For the foreground and the background, right? You have a sequence, you have a wave matrix, and you have a background model. You can compute this ratio, right, of sequence given uh, the model, right, the interpretation. Um, and then Bayes' theorem gives you an equation for this thing, which is what you want to know, right? What's the probability I'm looking at a binding site that looks like these transcriptive factors, right? But deriving this, which is easy and it's in my lecture notes, makes you aware that you have to provide this number, right? Now, if we go back to the biophysical representation, what do you think this, what is the interpretation of this? What would it be related to and, and what, what's there on the right? If I say that this is something like the KD, right? Uh, what's the other part in there? Yeah, maybe, or, or how about, you know, what what makes it more likely that something is interpreted as a binding site by the protein, right? How can I create more binding sites or fewer binding sites? What knob can I turn to, to change that balance? Does it matter whether I have more or less protein? See? If you have a cell type where a particular transcriptive factor is not expressed at all, it's not in the nucleus as a protein, right? Even if I have great um, in vitro binding sites in the genome, you know, with an excellent low KD that would immediately get occupied by this protein if it were there, right? If, if it has a low concentration, it's not going to happen, right? So if you, in the biophysical picture, you say we're really trying to compute the probability that the protein is bound to the DNA, right? Given the sequence, right? It just tells you that you can't compute that without specifying the concentration of the protein. Right? So in a biophysical framework, this makes total sense, but with this kind of um, weight matrix framework, it's actually usually not even discussed, right? It, the, you, can, you can work this out and you get something like the product of the ratio of the foreground and background probabilities, right? So, um, so often what is, what is used is um, the log base two of of this um, of this likelihood ratio, which if you work this out, right, you have a, a product over J, right? The ratio of these two things is the ratio of these two products, which I can just write as a single product over the ratio of F and P, right? And then I'm taking the log of a product becomes the sum of the log of the individual terms, right? So it's easy to see that the log of this thing, which is just defined as the ratio of these two probabilities of the data given the model, right, foreground and background model, that that is the sum over all j's, positions in the binding site, um, of the log base two of foreground probability over background probability. Right, so, um, Let's say that you're, you're more likely to have an A at the first position, this frequency may be close to one, right? And in the background, the random DNA, it's like a 25%, right? So this would be one over a quarter, would be four, take the log is two, right? So that's like a positive contribution to this, this term over here, right? And then if you have a base in your sequence that is actually has a low frequency in the alignment of the ex example sequences, right? You get that this is actually smaller than the background probability, right? You get the log of a ratio smaller than one, which is negative, right? So negative contribution to your score. And this, this is what is often called the PSSM score. Right? And that's, that's often what was plotted, you know, along the sequence. Right? But you could, you c if you want to use the PSSM score to compute 
the probability that you have a binding site, again, you have to specify this prior likelihood. Yeah, but usually uh, it's, this is just a score that's used. And it's a way of ranking sites, right, by in terms of their uh, degree of a match with, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the examples. Okay. Um, okay, so this explains that what is a weight matrix, with these frequency metrics, how do you get it and how do you think about it and how would you use them right, to compute a score for any possible sequence. The important thing is that this PSSM score is, you know, it, it's higher for good matches and it's, it's lower for, for worse matches, but there's not a simple one-to-one -one correspondence to this biophysical way of thinking about it, right? And, and also the way these weight matrices are discovered, which I'm, I'm not yet talking about, right? I'm assuming I have a weight matrix or some kind of alignment. I'm just showing you if you have the weight matrix, how do you use it to put a score on a sequence, right? We haven't yet talked about how do we actually infer this, what's the motif discovery, right? This is only about motif representation uh, so far. Um, but, but also, you know, the, the, say, algorithms like align A's or mean, like Gibbs sampler type algorithms, right? The way they, they get the, uh, find the motifs and, and, and the numbers in the matrix, there's not a simple relationship with the, there's, there's been, you know, there's, there's people have thought about this theoretically in the, for instance, the, the famous paper by Berg and von Hippel and, and Gary Stormer, who's actually both been pursuing the, uh, this approach and the biophysical approach, uh, right? If there, there's, there's, people have tried to make the best of the data, you know, say 10, 20 years ago, definitely, right, where you have to make more assumptions, and it's mostly that we have much more data now that we have the luxury of, of, of fitting these biophysical models to the data. So there's really, I think we're at a, a time where we're kind of switching from this old way of thinking about binding specificity to, to a biophysical way. Of, so I wanted to, but you know, both are used, and so I want you to be aware of both approaches and, and how to uh, relate them. Okay, so Let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, now about what this bit score means, right? Or where does it come from? And, and, uh, and um, who of you um, has heard about IUPAC, the generate symbols for like consensus motifs? Okay, so we'll talk about that too. Um, you may, if I write one on the board, you may actually say, oh, that's what you mean. I should have kept those sequences, but that's okay. <laughs> so, let's say we have a Toshiba factor that only binds to one sequence and nothing else, right? And we want to we, d we don't have a weight matrix, we don't have these kind of sequence logos, we just write like a string of letters. Right, so, so again, this A, C, G, C, G, T sequence, print, right? We could say, okay, this is the only sequence that has like a KD of 10 nanomotor, everything else is like a micromotor or something, right? So, um, but maybe we can tolerate an A or a T at the ends, right? Um, but nothing else, and in the core we have to have C, G, C, G, C. So how would you write that in a simple compact format? Anybody seen this symbol, W? So this, this really means, you know, you have A or T at the first position, and then you have C, G, C, G at position 2, 3, 4, 5, and you have A or T at the uh, sixth position. Why is it W? If A or T, why is the symbol for this W? You know, these symbols were uh, formalized or by the International uh, Commission or uh, hmm, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. That's why it's called the IUPAC symbols, right? That's some kind of convention to define this. I'm sure they did other stuff. Yeah, maybe the uh, amino acid letters and all that. R for arginine, that kind of stuff. Why is it W? Weak. Why is why is it weak? Right. A and T are two hydrogen bonds for the Watson-Crick base pair, right? Okay. So we have 
So let's just write down the, the different symbols. We have A, C, G, and T. Okay. And then we have um, W for a week, um, which is corresponds to a subset of two out of the four bases, right? So we have four possibilities here because we have four bases, right? And we're choosing one of them, right? And then four choose one, which is what's the value four <coughs> choose one? It's four, right? You know, I'm not assuming that, that everybody knows what this n choose k business is with the n factorial, k factorial, n minus k factorial. I'm happy to have like a little informal session tonight and or derive the formula for the hypergeometric and all that uh, if you think it would be useful, right? Um, but um, so we, we, we can let me know if you want to do that uh, after dinner or something, or after Mark or Stein's talk. Um, Okay, on to the to the next. So now there's a bunch of symbols that stand for two out of the four bases, and W is A or T. So what would C or G be? S for strong, right? Okay. Then there's other ways of of uh, distinguishing pairs of uh, of bases. Um, Anybody knows what, what this means in the context of DNA sequence? Purine. Yeah, purine, right? What is purines have how many rings? Two. two. Which of the four bases have two rings? Purine. Adenine and guanine can go on Wikipedia and, and, and check this, right? And then pyrimidine are the single ring. Of course, now, you, right, you know it's C or T. Right. right, so they have one ring. It's always, you know, the pairing is always between a purine and a pyrimidine, right? A and T is a purine pyrimidine combination, G and C, right? Because that's kind of, you know, it doesn't matter on what side, which strand the, the extra ring is, but, you know, it's the total width of that base pair, right, from the backbone to backbone of the both strands, right? That's why once a quick base pairing is always between the purine and the pyrimidine. Two more symbols, two more possibilities. What does K and M stand for? Keto and amino, right? So there's, there's another way of classifying. Uh, now, uh, there's always when it's a little dangerous to go without notes. This is the only point of my lecture. I haven't completely nailed down. Uh, anybody know what K is? I think I know. <laughs> okay, but it's something. It's in my uh, notes. You can download it. And then, so now we, we're on to uh, the third category of symbols that are standing for three out of the four possibilities. So we have an, a transcription factor that may tolerate an A, T, or C, right? But not a G, right? Um, so let's say we have the first symbol. Uh, it could be a C, a G, or a T, right? What would be a good symbol for this, C, G, or T? Why B? Right, why is B not A? It's the next letter in the alphabet, right? That's yeah. So that's how you remember this. So B, A plus one. Could have also been twenty-six, maybe Z instead of A or something. Okay. So A, we're skipping C now. G or T is what? D. D. Yeah, so far, so good. And skipping G, so it's A, C, or T. So what is that? G plus one is. Okay, one more to go. Um, C, G, or A, I guess. Not T, what is that? T plus one is, check your alphabet. U, is it a good idea to use U? Why not? Right, you're still DNA or RNA, right? So what do we do? Move on to the next letter in the alphabet. 
V, okay, good. So here there were four choose one. We have four bases. We're choosing one. There's four ways of doing that. Right? Here we have four choose two, right? which is, you know, you pick the first one, you pick the second one, three, and then you, then you realize that, you, you know, the order doesn't matter, so you're dividing by the number of ways in which to change the order, which is two, right? That's four times three right, divided by two. And then you realize that you can write this as four times three is really four factorial divided by everything you don't want to have in the product, right? And then times two factorial. And this is why n choose k is n factorial over n minus k factorial divided by k factorial, which is you know the number of ways and we could have arranged these things. So we can cancel tonight, but we're still happy to derive the hydrogen method. Okay. So and this block is four symbols because it's four choose three, right? Which is actually the same as four choose four um, four choose four minus three is four choose one. Right? Because instead of specifying what we're choosing, we could also have specified what we're not choosing, right? So it's the symmetry uh, or another equation is like n choose k is the same as n choose n minus k. Now there's one more symbol that we haven't discussed yet, and that is a, c, g, or t. What's a good letter for it, and why would that be a good uh, mnemonic? N. What's this N stand for? Anything. Any base or anything, yeah. In protein, it's X, right? Because N is already reserved for something else. So N, this is 4 choose 0. That's 1, because 0 factorial is defined as 1. Really, the reason for this is to make this work, right? If you don't choose anything, it's one way of doing that. And if you define 0 factorial as 1, then it works out nicely. Okay. This is 6. How much is 4 plus 6 plus 4 plus 1? 15. Good. Now, each of the four bases we could have picked or not, right? So the A we could have included or not. There's two possibilities. And then independently for C we could have included it or not. G and T. So there are two to the power, the number of bases, possibilities. That's 16, right? So why does it only add up to 15? Four yeah, 4 choose 0. Well, not this one, right? It's, well, I should have written 4 choose 4. Here, right? Uh, right? So we have you know, a case where we're not picking anything. It doesn't really make sense in, ter in the context of these binding consensus. Or maybe it does if you could have a deletion somewhere. But, you know, so in an alignment, of sequences, often the dash is used as a deletion, right? That the base is not there, even though it is there in some of the other sequences. So, right? So this, you could think of this as a special symbol, right? But it's not really, you know, relevant in, in this context. Okay, so these are IUPAC consensus, uh, right? And they allow you to um, to write to approximate these frequency matrices by these consensus. You could say if I have this matrix F, J, B, right, this matrix of A, C, G, and T by positions one through six, where each of these is a frequency that adds up to one in each column, you could say, let's only, let's coarse grain and let's say, okay, any base that has a frequency of being used as above 0.2 or 0.3 or, you know, something, right, we'll say that's in the set of bases, right, and, and everything is below that threshold is not in the set, right, and then, so you could, you say, okay, here the frequency for A is large enough for T, so then I put a W here, but then maybe C is 0.8 and all the other ones like smaller than 0.1, so then C is the only frequency that's really, uh, you know, worth considering at the second position, so you put a C there, etc. right? But you're throwing away information, of course, with the consensus motifs. Um, 
again, like, you know, not too long ago, this was a fine way to do it because the data that you had didn't even allow you to, right, to be so critical and, and be so quantitative about it, right? So it, it would give a false sense of, of quantification if you use a mat weight matrix, uh, right? Uh, the, the consensus motif was in a way good enough or, or as good. Uh, given the, the, the say five examples of, of uh, binding size that you have. <laughs> okay, so now um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll we'll go on a little longer. I just wanted to uh, to now explain what this bit score is, right, and, and how to uh, how to think about this. <laughs> so this this uses a concept called information entropy and, uh, and relative entropy. Which is always this mysterious thing, right? The entropy, uh, 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 and then uh, what, what is this? It has to do with steam engines and with some strange equations. Now, until you realize that uh, uh, it's really just a log of a count, right? And the number of ways in which you can have a certain configuration. You just take the log of it, write it in some ridiculous unit k cal per mole to make life harder, right? And then, and then so, right? So you have the entropies. Basically, you you have a count n. Right? Then you take the log of it, right? And then you, you multiply by uh, um, by some weird constant, uh, Boltzmann constant, and then uh, the, the temperature, right? And that means that if you want really want to know the count, right, you have to, and you call this entropy, right? And then it means if you really want to have the count, you have to multiply or divide by, by kT, right? You take the entropy divided by KT, and then you exponentiate it, maybe with a binding sign. Right. That's why, uh, of course, you know, it's, it's not as, you know, that um, really, but why thermodynamics is hard is there is a macroscopic way of thinking about it with heat transport and, right, the classic thermodynamics with the steam engines and all that. And then there's the statistical mechanics, which is we have like full microscopic models and you're writing the, the, you know, equations for the probabilities of the states of the system. It's in a way much easier to understand all this thermodynamic stuff in the, the modern framework. But then if you want to connect it to the old framework, things get hard and you have to uh, you think about entropy. Um, but um, the way, and then in the information theoretical sense, this is where this bit score comes in. It has to do with uh, something I like to think about in terms of the number of questions you have to ask to find out the state of a system, right? So, so let's think about um, uh, our four bases in terms of a binary representation, right? So you have bits can be zero or one, right? And there's two possibilities. Now, how many bits do we need to specify A, C, G, and T? Two, right? Because then we have four, po four possibilities, two times two. So for instance, we could say A is zero, zero, Right, of course, the bits, uh, no, this is now the first and the second bit counting from the right, and then C would be one, zero, G would be zero, one, and T would be one, one. Okay, now, if I specify both bits, I, um, I have a, uh, um, I have a, you know, I know it's an A. If I would only tell you the first, like the left bit is zero, Right, you would know it's a purine A or or no, it's a pyrimidine actually. Why does this not come out? Uh, oh no, it is okay. Like if this first leftmost bit, if that's one, it's C or T, right? It's a pyrimidine, and um, if if it's a zero, it's A or G, purine. Right, and then so so let's say um, I have a base in mind. Right? You don't know what base I have in mind, but you can find out by asking me questions. Right? But you cannot ask, what is the base? Right? You can only ask uh, questions that have a yes or no answer. Right? That's the bit, zero or one. Right? So now the, the thing is that there are, there are uh, uh, different levels of cleverness for in terms of the questions that you could ask. Right? For instance, is it a good to ask, an efficient to ask the question, is it A? No, right? Because if it's not A, you still have three out of the four possibilities. You still have to rule out two more, right? But if I ask, is it a purine, right? You've, whatever the answer is, you've ruled out two of the four possibilities, right? So it's efficient. So um, the entropy 
at the beginning, before you started asking questions, the, the, the degree of uncertainty, um, which is basically the, the log base two of the number of possibilities, so it would be two, uh, that is something like the number of questions that you have to, binary questions you have to ask if you ask you know, smart questions. So, um, right, so, so that's why, um, the, 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 this is where this information theoretical uh, uh, approach comes in. The only thing is that um, the, the entropy is large if I don't know anything, right? If I don't know where this A, C, G, or T, it's two bits of, of entropy, right? But that's exactly where there, there's no height here of the letters, right? I don't see anything, right? So the height is not just the entropy, right? It's, it's related to it, but it's somewhat different. Right? So let's talk about um, what this is. What is, the, what is the equation for entropy? Does this look familiar? Like a sum over something and then log base two probability if you have a bunch of states and the probability of each state is P sub i. Right? So, so why is there a minus sign and why is there a log? So you can write this a little bit differently, it's more intuitive, but you could say it's the probability times one, or sorry, the, the log of one over the probability. And, you know, if this is just probabilities of the different states, for instance, I is A, C, G, or T, you can think of this as the average value of the log of one over the probability. Right? Averaged over those same probabilities, used as a, as a weight. And 1 over p log base 2 is something like the number of binary questions that you have to ask to find out the state of the system. So again, like thinking back to what we had, I have a base in mind, you don't know what it is, right? That means a priori, the probability of every base is a quarter. Let's say that, you know, this is how we define the game, right? I have like a, a, a way of generating a random base, right? I have no control over what I pick, but and I know that outcome of each for each base is equal, uh, right? It's just that I have that information, but you don't have it yet, so um, so that's why I have this entropy, right? So there the probability would be a quarter, and log base two of one over a quarter is log base two of four is two, right? So something like the average number of questions that you have to ask. Right? And that's, uh, now it turns out that, that the height of the letters in the, in the sequence logos is two minus minus that entropy, right? And more generally, the formula for that is it's um, the sum over all the bases of the frequency that we talked about before. So this is just the frequency in this, in this alignment of frequency matrix, right? Times the log base two of foreground probability over background probability. This thing is the height of the column of letters at position J. So it's an average over all the four bases, right? So it's not specific to one base. It's a property of the distribution across the four bases, right? And it's the average of this thing where, you know, one over P would be the number of questions you have to ask to figure out the background model, right? This is a little more, more subtle. This is how many more questions do I have to um, ask, or how many fewer questions do I have to ask uh, about th the sequence if, if I have the foreground model. For instance, if you always have a t t an A at the first position according to a weight matrix, right, and I'm, I'm generating a random sequence according to that weight matrix model, and you know the weight matrix, right? With information theory, you know the probabilities. We both know the probabilities. It's just that you don't know the specific state of the system that I generated randomly. But if you know that the weight matrix has 100% probability for an A at the first position, how many questions do you have to ask? Well, if you know before, you know, you don't have to ask anything, you know it's an A, right? So how many questions is that? Zero, Zero right? And two minus zero is two. So that means if you have a position that's fully specified, for instance, as a T, you would have something like this. 
How about this W? What would be the uh, the the, uh, the the relative entropy over the background model for this thing? So now, how many bits of information do we do we specify here? One, right? So you would have a total height in the weight matrix of one, but then A and T would both be there, but their height would add up to one, right? One bit of information, right? So these symbols have one bit of information associated with them. They would be have a height of one bit in the in the sequence logos. Here it's a little trickier, right? There's three out of the four possibilities is somewhere between zero and one, um, right? and then if you have an n, there's uh, there's no you know, in the case of N, it means that all the four probabilities for A, C, G, and T are the same as the background in your weight matrix, right? And that means F equals P, this is one for every base, log of one is zero, right? And then it adds up to zero. You, have the, right? you get a zero height for your um, columns. The way you compute the height of an individual letter, right? So what is the height of this T here, right? It's just that you you scale the letters relative to their frequency. So the height of letter B, base B, so A, C, G, or T, at position J, is the total height of the column right, times the frequency of that base in the weight matrix. Right? And of course, if you sum over all four bases, this sum is one, and it just adds up to this total height that this is information entropy. But it's important to keep in mind that from a biophysical point of view, which again we'll, we'll talk about uh, later, is really what matters is the, the relative affinity for a binding site that has a, an A, a C, or a G, right? So from a biophysical point of view, all that matters is the, the relative height of letters. If you have two different bases, right, what's the ratio of, of frequency, the ratio of letter heights? That's what's relevant. Uh, um, the information, uh, access here is more for human consumption, right? It gives us, you know, information about whether this factor has specificity or not. It's not part of the model to compute the affinities. It's kind of a different thing. Right? But it does tell you what are the important positions that specify the, 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 the uh, specificity. Okay. Um, so let's take a, a short 10-minute break and then let's come back here for just another half hour or so because I want to now switch uh, to motif discovery from motif representation and we'll start with a simple discovery of like over, over represented k-mers and you have a bunch of sequences right um, maybe some genes that are upregulated or genes that are you know, windows that are bound by a transcription factor and you want to see if any substrings are, are Overrepresented relative to random sequence, right? So how do you go about this? And uh, there's a there's a paper from about 15 years ago that figured this out using the binomial distribution. That that is still, I think, a very uh, powerful method. And there's a lot of you know, things that are kind of emulating it these days. But uh, but it will show you the kind of simple incarnation of a discriminative motif finding uh, uh, model, where you have a positive set of sequences and negative set of sequences, right? And you you score for overrepresentation. Let's, so now we're switching gears from uh, motif representation to motif discovery. Um, there's, there's a couple of different classes of motif discovery algorithms. Um, and so one that's kind of the oldest, uh, maybe until recently most widely used, is to say, you know, I want to have, remember this wave matrix was here, you know, with the height of the letters. The, the higher the letter columns are, the better, right? We like to see all these nice big letter columns, right? There's, there's a lot of information there. So um, let's use the total height of all these letters, the sum over all J of this letter height, which was this thing, right? Um, as our, and that's our the information content, say, of the, of the, of the binding site, right? Um, Let's use that as the objective function. That is the thing that we want to maximize, right? So if we don't know what these Fs are, but we have a background model, right? Um, let's try to find the, the weight matrix that gives us the, the best information content. So 
we were starting from, I was saying, we're taking that alignment for granted, right? You have a bunch of binding sites, you know, in the old days would be uh, from mutagenesis or footprinting, right? You mutate some promoter with a reporter gene, you'd know, like if you muted it here, you screw up the expression of the reporter. Um, so that's where the factor is binding, and you could do DNA's footprinting, for instance, right, and see physically where it's blocking, uh, the, pro the transcription factor is blocking the DNA, and from that you could kind of narrow down the binding site to a, a window of, say, 10 uh, base pairs on, the, on that promoter, and you have do that for different um, uh, regulatory regions, and you get a bunch of uh, sequences. Now, let's say we have um, done a microarray experiment, Right, and we, we uh, found that there's some number of genes that were upregulated, like with the GASH data, right, in the, in the, in the when we were doing the, uh, uh, the GO scoring uh, the other day, right? So now we, we've done expression profiling of a bunch of genes, right? So we have the mRNA levels, but we don't know explicitly where the binding sites are within the promoters of those genes that were upregulated, right? So I'm drawing here three genes uh, to represent the set of genes that was upregulated in my microarray experiment, or it, of course that set of genes could come from any kind of experiment, right? Not necessarily microarray expression profiling experiment, or it could, for instance, be a bunch of chip seek peaks, right, for some transcription factor, you know, and the peak width is maybe 200 base pairs. We know that there's a motif that's driving the enrichment in the immunoprecipitation there, right, or a, a motif that's driving the upregulation of these genes, but we don't know where within this few hundred base pair long region this motif is located. Right? So I could make a guess, right? Let's put these some windows randomly. Let's say I assume some width of the binding side, maybe eight base pairs, right? Um, and then I just put them randomly. Um, and then I say, well, these windows, th that defines the alignment of the underlying sequence, right? So I'm just going to take whatever sequence is under this window, put it you know, above the sequence of this window and just create an alignment of these sequence under these windows. And I say, you know, the first base position in that window for in the different promoters corresponds to each other, right? And that was gives me a way of constructing a frequency matrix, right? And then I compute this, this, this score. Um, this gives me an, an algorithm now that says, you know, given whatever weight matrix I have, you know, that depends on where these windows are, right? gives me a scoring scheme. I could now slide a window across any of these promoters, right? And say I want to pick a better position for this window that's more consistent with the sequence that I have under these other windows, right? So I use the weight matrix that I constructed to uh, slide this window, find a better position, and put it there, and then recompute the weight matrix, the frequencies in this matrix, and keep going, right? Theoretically, if I, let's say I have a 1KB long promoter, there are a thousand positions for the first window, there's independently a thousand possible positions where the second, the motif, the same motif could be located in the second promoter, et cetera, right? If I could enumerate all the combinations, a thousand to the power a hundred upregulated genes, for instance, it would be great. I would try them all out and pick the configuration of window positions that gives maximizes this score, right? It's not possible to do this exhaustively. That's why there's sampling algorithms that try to achieve this, right? That Gibbs sampler algorithms like MEME, or well, it's not, that's not quite, it's a little different, but uh, but you know this type of uh, motif finding algorithm like Align A's, right? It's but it's it's a sampling based way of optimizing this information comp to basically discover where the motifs are within these promoters, right? And so that that you hit upon the the patches in these longer s sequences that are similar to each other. Now, a possible drawback of doing this is that you find motifs that are shared um, within that set of promoter sequences, right? And they're overrepresented relative to my model for random DNA, right? So in that sense, they're special. Um, but this objective function is not necessarily building in this notion that these motifs have to be specific to these genes relative to the rest of the genome, right? So if I find a motif from this by taking a promoter of 100 special genes, finding some motif that's, you know, I see there more than, than random, it doesn't tell me that this motif will only occur preferentially in those promoters compared to the rest of the genome, right? That's a different question. Um, for instance, if every gene would have a Tata box, right, 
which is a blatant lie. You read it in your textbook. It was only like you know one percent or ten percent of the genes has a Tata box. But let's assume every gene has a Tata box. Right? You would find a Tata-like motif if even if you picked a hundred genes randomly from the genome and run this motif finding algorithm on on their promoters, right? So you would need some way of of of, of quantifying the specificity of, of the motif that you found for this set of promoters. Now, how could we do this? And uh, right, what is the uh, uh, was mentioned before that you know, in most contexts you can think of an, exp uh, an application of fission success tests. So let's think of an application of fission success tests now in this context. Right, we found a motif. Uh, we have a weight matrix that we can use to, to you know, mark instances of that same motif in any promoter sequence, right? How could we, a posteriori, reassure ourselves that motif that we found from these hundred genes is actually specific to these hundred genes? It's, you know, it's overrepresented in the promoters of these hundred genes relative to the rest of the genome. You have similar data to the rest of the genome. Yeah, so you could, you know, you say this is my positive set, right? And I have an negative set is the rest of the genome and occasionally I'll have a match to that same motif there right? but I hope that it's not as often as in this set right? and then I could say I have n genes and k of those genes contain the motif right? so k, big k, big n is total number of genes positive set, negative set K is the big K is the number of genes that contain a match to this motif, um, and then I have little n genes in my uh, positive set, right? And of those n little n genes, little k have a match to this motif, right? And then we're back to the the, the go scoring, you know, an analogy where we have all promoters, the promoters that contain the motif, the promoters that were upregulated, and we're asking whether promoters that, that had the motif, you know, enriched uh, relative to the, the whole genome. Right, so that, that would be a way to kind of, to a posteriori, uh, make sure that your motif is, is, is really uh, specific to that uh, 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 set of genes and not some Tata box-like thing. Now, um, we could turn this in, uh, into a motif finding algorithm as well, right? We could say we're, we're using after, we fi first find a motif using some different approach and then we check whether this motif is enriched in this positive set relative to the rest of the genome, we could actually use that uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as the basis of a motif-finding algorithm, right? Um, so we'd have a discriminative uh, uh, approach to finding this motif, where we're not discriminating between foreground and random DNA background, but we're discriminating between a positive set of longer sequences that contain the motif and a negative set of sequences. Um, and so you could imagine that, that the hypergeometric uh, would also be a good way of, uh, of building a motif algorithm, right? You could say, now, now of course here we were talking about a weight matrix, right? And, and when I was drawing a box, I meant I had some kind of weight matrix score above some threshold, which is of course already an approximation, right? Let's, let's make it a little simpler, and that's also what the computer lab is gonna do. Let's say we, we just want to find uh, say hexamers, right? We want we say we have a the weight matrix. We just we say we're approaching it as a as a consensus motif kind of thing, right? So we're we're asking, for instance, is this motif um, overrepresented in my positive set relative to the negative set? Right? And then I could actually enumerate all four to the six possible hexamers, right? And for each of them, one by one, ask, is this motif enriched in the positive set? And then maybe I'll rank all those four to the six motifs in terms of their level of enrichment. And there's hopefully some subset of them are, uh, are significant, right? Give a significant hypergeometric p value. Now, of these four numbers, which ones would change if I change the motif? Right, if big K is the number of promoters in the whole genome that contain the motif. Right, is, is N going to change? The no, I change? No. How about big K? Yes, because you know, a different motif, right? The, where the boxes are is now completely different, right? You have to, again, look at the underlying genome sequence. Right? This set, of course, there's 
the same set of upregulated genes. We're, we're doing motif discovery on this set of genes, so that's not changing, right? But little k within that set also depends on the motif. Now, the universe that we're using here for the hypergeometric scoring is, you know, the, the, the things in the universe are genes, right? They're promoter regions. Now, it's known that, that often, uh, it's not necessarily that, that promoter contains only one match to a motif, right? Actually, there's cooperativity between binding of multiple proteins nearby binding sites, right? That's, that helps uh, overcome, you know, the, the fact that the genome is so large, right? And this cooperativity uh, often means that having two binding sites, uh, you know, it's, you're going to have, uh, you're going to be more likely to be expressed, right? So somehow, um, a motif that would occur multiple times in my positive promoter set, we'd like to take that motif more seriously than motif that occurs only once, right? We want to somehow take into account these multiple occurrences of the motif in the promoter sequences. So, so the question is how to, what is a natural way of, um, of doing that? Um, and one way to approach it is to say, okay, my universe is not a universe of promoter regions, right? But let's think of every possible window position in any possible promoter as one unit, right? So you have just a, a large number of window positions, essentially the size of the genome, or maybe the combined size of all these promoter regions, right? And, and for each of those, uh, we're asking two questions. Is it in the pos somewhere in one of the promoters in the positive set, right? And we're asking, does it match the motif that we're currently uh, scoring the enrichment of? And um, uh, so that's, uh, it again, gives us a two by two table, right? But now the counts are the number of hexamer window positions, right? So you could do, a, again, the very same approach, it's just the interpretation here is different. Now, big K is the total number of matches to this motif in all those combined promoters, rather than the uh, than the number of promoters that contain at least one motif match, for instance, right? And you put more weight on these multiple occurrences. Um, now, one more step, uh, and basically then we've, that's the algorithm we're gonna implement in R, is that um, the counts that get really high now, right, for uh, when, when, when we're talking about uh, millions of, of base pairs. Um, and it's exactly in this regime where the counts are large that the hypergeometric distribution it can be well approximated by the what's called the binomial distribution. Um, and it has to do with the following. If we, if we have an urn, right? So we're going back to our hypergeometric sample where we have an urn with marbles, right? Two different colors, right? And we're drawing marbles from the urn. We have a sample, right? Um, um, the, um, um, the when we draw the first marble, right, so in the first round, and it's sampling without replacement, right, so uh, this probability is going to change as we build up our sample. But the first time we draw a marble, uh, what's the probability of, of it being, uh, you know, this special uh, marble that we, that K is based on? Right, Does, what's the success rate of getting one of those marbles? How about big K over big N, right? There's N marbles, K of those are, are the special ones, right? And the rate of picking one of those marbles, right? One of them that's in the go category or one of them that's in the, in the, in the positive set, right? Be K over N. Now, there's two possibilities. The first marble, right, was um, a success or not. And so depending on what happens in the next, in that round, in the next round, either are gonna have still K of those special marbles, but now out of a total population that's reduced by one, or I'm going to, when I picked, you know, one of those special marbles in the first round, is K minus one over N minus one, right? See, this is a little larger than this. This is a little smaller than the prior probability. Now, if the number of marbles is very large, you can, essentially say this is the same as that, right? So just that every round, every time you draw a marble, it's the same success rate, which we just call P now, right? Which is K over N. So we're saying, we don't care about how many marbles there are in this giant urn, 
all I care about is a proportion between the two types of marbles, right? And I just summarize the property of the urn by this one number t. Okay? And then instead of having the hypergeometric probability of some k number of successes in a sample, given the sample size and you know what is in the urn, <coughs> I now can approximate this by the binomial probability of k given sample size and the success rate. Right? So there's one fewer parameter to the binomial and it relates to k and n through this equation. And if we define something that's called q, which is one minus p, so it's like the failure rate is the success rate. Okay. Um, we can think about this binomial saying that, you know, I have p plus q, right, to the power, the number of times I sample. Right? Every time I sample a marble, either I have success or failure, right? So what is the, what if I have k successes, right, I pick the p term in this, right? If I write this out, right, I could ask, you know, how many possible polynomial, polynomials does it generate? p to the k times q to the n minus k, I have to pick something for every p term in this product, right? Uh, but then, of course, the number of ways I could have picked k p's, right, and, and then um, out of those n possibilities, right, is n choose k. And this is the binomial probability for, for the binomial, right? So this is this probability of k successes given the sample size and the success rate. When we were doing this thing earlier with the IUPAC symbols, I was saying that if you add up all those n choose k things, right, it has to add up to 2 to the power of 4, right? And it was 15, and why was it not 16, etc. cetera, right? Um, for the binomial, of course, p and q add up to 1, right? And that's why the binomial is normalized. If, right, again, um, let me write this very explicitly. V of k, right, given n and p is given by n choose k, p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. And so, because p and q add up to 1, it just means that the binomial distribution is normalized. If I sum over all possible values of k from 0 to little n, it adds up to 1, right? Because 1 to the power n is 1, right? And then the sum over little k here, uh, right, it's, it's, it's also um, equal to 1. In a way, it's a proof of this normalization. Now, I could have also picked p and q both equal to 1, right? So they wouldn't add up to 1. Because this is a general formula, right? It's not specific to the binomial. So then I get 1 plus 1 to the power n equals, uh, and then this was actually the sum, right, from k0 to n of, uh, of all these terms. Right, and, and now p and q are equal to 1, so these are 1, so it shows that the sum from k0 to n of n choose k equals 2 to the power n. Right, so this is the proof of delight, you know, why, these, why we need 16 IUPIC symbols. <coughs> okay, so um, this idea of, of, so now we can use the binomial to score the overrepresentation of a motif, right? We have um, some success rate that's specific to the motif, and then we have a sample size, which is the total number of hexamer windows that get fit in any of these promoters in the positive set, right? Um, right, so n is the effective combined length of, of all the promoter sequences in my uh, positive set. And the success rate, how do we compute this? Why do, what is p? Right? What do I expect? See, it's important the binomial is the null distribution for the number of motif matches in my positive set, right? It's not the actual number of motif matches. What I'm asking is, if I would have picked these 100 promoters randomly from all the 10,000 promoters in the genome, right, how, how many motif matches would I expect in that sequence? Okay. Um, and it's essentially, you know, the density of this motif in the genome, right, or in the combined promoter region. So you just 
you count how many you have in all the promoters, you divide by the total number of hexamer window positions in those promoters. Uh, if all motifs would be equally likely, if the genome would be like a truly a random 25% ACGMT random string, then what would be the success rate for any motif? You get one match in how many base pairs? Four to the six, right? So it's 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 uh, one over four to the six, one over two, four thousand ninety six. But you know, actual genomes they have a lot of local biases. There's like poly A, poly T signals that have to do with nucleosome positioning and all that. Where there's chemical biases with the polymerases. So it's much better to not assume anything about the, the rate at which any kind of motif occurs in the genome, you can count it, right? We have the whole genome, we know, so it's easy to count this motif and then uh, compute the actual density of that motif in, the, in these genome-wide promoter regions, right? And then we use that to score the enrichment of the motif in the promoter regions. Now, so we'll get this null distribution, right? It's the number of First is the number of matches in my positive set, right? It will be starting at zero, will be some kind of distribution like this, right? And then given the actual number of motif matches in the positive set, right? We'll again take the, the positive till, the sum of all the binomial norm distribution probabilities from that actual value of k up to the largest possible value. And instead of p hyper that we use for the ghost squaring, now we'll use p binom for, you know, binomial. And again, we have this lower till equals false thing with the, we have to subtract one from k to get the right p-value, right? But it's the same thing. Um, how about multiple testing, right? Do we have to worry about multiple testing if we are computing a binomial p-value for every hexamer to discover some special hexamer that we don't know beforehand? Uh, and how do we correct for multiple testing? Do we multiple we do the Bonferroni correction, for instance, do we multiply by, by what, the number of genes or, or the length of the genome or what? Also, a good way to think about this is that we're doing multiple testing correction, right? So we're, 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 we're uh, worried about doing multiple tests. And what is doing a, a test is computing a p-value, right? That's, that's equivalent, right? So basically, you can always answer this question by asking yourself, how many p-values do I compute? Right? Now, we're computing a p-value for every what? For every position or for every promoter or? See, the recipe was pick a motif, right? Then find all the matches in, in you know, in a positive set and a negative set. Compute the, the density of that motif, you know, in, in all those promoters, and then compute the, the binomial p-value. Right? So you have one p-value for one motif, and then you pick the next motif and you go through the same thing again, and you get another p-value. So how many tests do we perform if we have hexamers? Four to the six. Yeah, four to the six, right? So we have to multiply the p-value by 4096. Or the p-value times 4096, that's the expected number of, uh, you know, motifs that would give you, uh, you know, that, at that level of significance, right? So, um, uh, and you can also compute an FDR based on that. But, um, but you want that p-value to be small even after you multiply by the number of motifs. Okay, so um, so we're going to move now to the uh, to the other side of the building, and um, I'm going to there's two tutorials. I'll, I'll point out exactly what their names are, but it's it's all posted in this directory: resources, my name, and then motifs, right? And there's there's two short vignettes. One is about how do I construct a table of motif counts. For instance, all hexamers, right? I want to have a table of genes by hexamers, right? Uh, and many genes are in the genome by 4096, right? How do I construct such a table, which, you know, would be 
you uh, needed to, to do this uh, kind of statistics, right? And then there's a separate uh, tutorial that is to actually implement this discriminative motif. Okay, then I'll, I'll quickly demonstrate a website developed by a guy named uh, Jacques Van Helden, who's in Belgium, who came up with this first. It was a paper from 1998 that, uh, that, um, that, that first uh, defined this. And uh, once in a while, you see a paper that does the same thing, right? that doesn't cite the ethically deserved recognition. So anyway, I have to do this. Okay, so we'll meet the next story right away. Thank <laughs> you.